All right, well, I'm a big nerd about how movies are made, so I've always okay. wanted to go on set and see a film get shot. Mm -hmm. So the scene when Helena actually, you're circling around and you're actually turning yeah. in from the from the dress yeah. to the next dress, how does that look on set? Because obviously it's, it's not in one shot yeah. in the film. How do they do that? So, well, first of all, we did it on this night shoot, and I and it, everyone was really tired, and it was the middle of the night, and it was winter, and I was freezing. And um, I sort of learned this routine where I'd spin. Um, but then later on, we did it again indoors. It was the last shot of the whole movie. Oh, um, really? And I was on this rotating, a rotating platform. And first of all, I did it in the pink dress, then I did it in the blue dress. And I had to, they had an image of what I'd done, and then I had to replicate it so that they could seamlessly change the pink into the blue with CGI. So cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, Kenneth did an amazing job with that yeah. shot. It's all one shot. I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad there was no cut there. It was really, it was, it, and, and I would sort of like, you, they would, um, on the computer, they would put me doing it in the pink and the blue dress, and it and it had to be exact. Like my arms had to be doing the exact same thing. It's so cool. Yeah, it really is cool. Now with the slipper in the movie, I'm, this is just like a nerdy question too. But obviously, it fits your foot. So the people whose foot it doesn't fit throughout the production, did, did they make it specifically designed just for you? Is that did they? How do they do that? Well, um, no, it doesn't fit any foot. How do they do it in the movie? They CGI it on. Really? Yeah, that's I know. awesome. <laughs> Wait, that's really? Seriously? Yeah, well, because it's made of Swarovski crystal. Oh. So actually, I guess they could have made one that at least my foot could have, like, like slipped into. Yeah. But then I got size... I mean, maybe they wanted it to be smaller because I got size six. Maybe okay. they wanted... I don't know. It feels quite tiny, doesn't that's it? That's insane. <laughs> it looks so real. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so I'm, like, blown so away So I now. wore, like, little shoes with green dots on. Oh, it's like motion capture mm -hmm, almost. Mm -hmm. Now, with TV shows like Down Abbey, you get multiple, multiple seasons, multiple arcs, and mm. to go, you have a long mm. uh, arc there. In a movie, you get two hours. Mm. So I'm wondering what you prefer. Do you prefer, like, could you imagine fleshing out Cinderella over five, six seasons? Like, how could you, because that, is that even something that could be possible considering um, the storyline? I guess so. I mean, we wait to see what happens to Cinderella 2, yeah. Cinderella 3, yeah. Cinderella 4, when they're like, the slipper old doesn't fit and the unhappy. sequel, fits in the third yeah. one. <laughs> Finally, they make a slipper that fits Her me. Feet for grow at some yeah. point. <laughs> I don't know how they yeah. would do that. Um, I really enjoyed actually having a beginning, a middle, and an end yeah. because it meant that you can sort of plan your journey of your performance. And with Downton, you never know what's going to happen to your character, so that 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 throws up a sort of sense of spontaneity and, and an excitement, but also it has challenges too with sort of knowing where you're going. When you're, when you're actually riding in the carriage, it's breaking down. Is that all done through CGI as well? Well, um, a lot of it was CGI, but loads of it was, I had the, I mean, it was the coolest day. It was one of my favorite days. Yeah. I was on a trampoline. I was on like a zip <laughs> wire and I like span like on a rope, like on a, in a harness. I was clamped into this silver arm, which spinned me. I had a pumpkin made of like, um, like sort of polystyrene or like foam and men were pushing it in and I was going like this and, they, and I had a pumpkin that I had holes for my arms and my legs that I ran in. So, Alright, this is what I want to see. Yeah. Someone released the Cinderella know, no CGI. I said, when I watched the film for the first time I was like, Ken, where has the shot of me running in a pumpkin gone? Are you crazy? Uh, DVD feature yeah. on completely a no CGI version yeah, of Cinderella. No. Right, well, it was good to see you. Congratulations. Nice to see. I think I can say for all the Game of Thrones fans out there, it's good to see you alive. Thanks very much. Thank you for being here. I'm all right. It's, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Now, I want to ask you about accent changes because I feel like it's such an interesting thing to talk to an actor, hear mm. their real accent, but mm. then see them in a movie. What is the hardest part about this particular accent in regards to changing it? Did you have to struggle with any of the particular words or letters? Um, I struggled with trying to not sound like the Queen of England. <laughs> I didn't want to sound too posh and kind of alienate him. Mm. Uh, so I, I kind of, I just, I'm not method actor in any way, but I... I stay in accent when I'm when I'm working in a different accent through the whole film just to get these these rhythms and, and tones right. right. Um, but you know I really enjoyed doing it. Like one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when you first meet Cinderella and you're kind of like blown away that she has no idea who you actually are. Mm. I wonder like is, like in your real life is that something that you look for like people who don't know that you're an actor like is that something that you try to like I don't know is that is that, is that, is that mm. you know what I mean? No I don't know I suppose you just you just never know if someone kind of does know you from something or doesn't and if you focus on it too much I think you become a Ultra paranoid because you can be like, oh God, you know, like I'm, a, I'm a, you're aware of yourself because you think people know you from a show, and actually no one's seen the show, and you know, and then yeah. so you have to kind of awkward. yeah, then it's awkward, or you're like, I'm absolutely fine, you know, I can get really drunk, and no one knows me from the show, and then suddenly people have got their cell phones out, and you're like, oh dear, I'm making terrible decisions. <laughs> uh, so I think you have to just not really think about it and just have fun. All right, this is a totally nerdy question because I love Game of Thrones. Sure. 
if they were to Disneyfy Game of Thrones, like you bring it into like a, could, what would it look like? What would the Red Wedding scene look like if it was like a Disney m movie? Like how could they could oh they even God. pull that off? I don't think they could pull it off. <laughs> I mean, th there's there's so much TNA in, in Game of Thrones. I don't think we can Disneyfy that. <laughs> they just yeah, instead of like killing somebody, you hit him with a wand. I don't know. Oh, I don't do you know, know what I mean? What they would do? I don't think we could get away with it. Someone needs to get George R. R. Martin on the phone and take care of this. Right. Cinderella meets Game of Thrones. He just kill us all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, you know, one of the most powerful shots in the film for me, without giving anything away, there's a moment where it's an emotional moment between your father, that's all yeah. I'll say. And the, Kenneth does this amazing shot where he pans mm. the shot up and you see the crown. Brilliant. Amazing shot. So I want to ask you, are you, as an actor, when you're in a scene like that, are you aware of the shot itself? Do you know how epic that shot is as you're doing it? I don't know how epic it is, but know how significant it is. Yeah. Especially with the, you know, the the crown at the top yeah. of it. I think it's really in, important and, and knowing what image we were, were leaving, which gives me license to do something physical in that moment on mm. on the bed that I think is quite a, a, like a, a powerful moment. It gives us a chance to do that when you kind of know what the shot's going to be. When you leave a part, I mean, obviously this or something like Game of Thrones, do you miss a role? Like, do you miss Rob Stark at all? Do you miss being him on set? Like, do you, is that something like, do you like wake up and go, gosh, I wish I can go to set today and be him again? No, I mean, I was, I was Rob Stark for like five years, really. You know, that kind of, it went on that long. And so you kind of, you always, you know in your head, uh, as an actor, well, I do at least, where you go, okay, this is the start and middle and end of something. And you mm -hmm. kind of say goodbye to something. And, and I'd reached the end of, of the story with Rob Stark. You know, I still... I'm still very close with everyone, and I miss being part of that family because it was. You see these people every day, and and it's great to be around them. But you know that was a great part of my life. I'm kind of uh, leaving a high note. Yeah. It's good to see you, by the way. You too. I have to ask you. Obviously, your character is quote unquote cruel at times. So I want to ask you when you have a moment like that, and you're on camera acting in a cruel way, and the camera cuts. Do you go back to being nice, or do you keep up the cruel vibe off camera to kind of keep the set going for the movie going? The best sets, no matter what the, the genre of the film, are playful sets. Hmm. And so working with Holiday and Sophie and with Lily, it was really, really playful. And with Stellan, of course. Uh, and so it's, it, the play just extends beyond, it doesn't necessarily um, have to do with the scene. Like often when you're doing a scene that is incredibly um, emotionally charged, mm. it's often great to go in there laughing because it's just about being open to what the other actors are doing. So I think it's, um, I mean, Ken keeps a very buoyant set. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was definitely bold. What I find fascinating is that I interview actors who say when they play a villain, they just say they don't consider the character to be a villain because they have to kind of justify what the person is doing. So when you go into a character like this who can be quote unquote a villain in the Cinderella story, mm. do you have to justify what her actions, because now we get kind of a backstory to who she was. Yeah, I mean, it's not its not the stepmother's story, obviously, but it, it does interest me what makes people tick and mm. what makes, she's always, she's never actually given a name, really. She's always called the evil or the wicked or the ugly stepmother. Right. Um, she, and the fact that she was given a name, Lady Tremaine, um, which she has in some of the renditions of the story, it was really fantastic. And all of us were interested in the three dimensional qualities, obviously within a fairy tale setting. But you are playing the villain. Mm. You know, you're you're playing the 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 dark side to Cinderella's light, and that that's you know you do have to serve the story in that way. So it's not about being likable, but it's about being perhaps understood. If you could see this character in another room, in a room with one of your other characters having a conversation, who would be interesting to see a back and forth with, with the wicked stepmother and then someone else you've Ooh, played? Oh, I wouldn't mind seeing a showdown between Elizabeth the first and the stepmother, <laughs> <That's> both <laughs> redheads. Yes, <laughs> in a in a big tub of jelly. <laughs> what would they talk? <laughs> they wouldn't talk. They just go at it. Yeah. No, I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, that'd be because they're both they're both people who understand the way the world works. Right. And they're both trying to surf that as as women in a man in men's in a men's world. Right. So. right. Uh, as we as we get the backstory to your character in the, in the film, I know a script only lends so much to yeah. a, who a person is. I'm wondering, like, in, even in previous roles in this role, what are things that you add in personally that maybe we wouldn't know, like, a, who, who her parents were, her birthday, her favorite foods. Like, do you add those things into the characters before you walk on a set? Do you know? those things about the person? Um, often, it depends on the role and also the way you're working. Like if you're improvising a lot, then that those sort of details are really important. But I think the way a character moves through a space, who they are drawn to, um, 
who they will touch or not touch, mm. who they um, need and don't need. Those kind of primal things are, uh, are really important, particularly in a landscape uh, like this. And so much is informed by the world, that, the visual world that you're in, and also the costumes that you're wearing. Because a lot of that stuff is um, the evil. So if you're wearing green, you don't have to play jealousy because oh. you kind of visually are given that anyway. So sometimes that then, you know, well, I'm wearing that costume so I can play against it in that other way. So mm. it's often... Um, it's, it's often not uh, psychological in that way, in order to, for the result to be psychological, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And last time I spoke with you was for Thor, and we were talking about the use of canted angles, because you wanted to look, it was look like a, like a comic book yeah, yeah, was like, turning. Yeah, exactly. And you have a shot in this film which blew my mind when she was running through the, the, the yeah. room, and you start the angle like yeah. this, yeah. And then you wave it this way. Yeah. It's in the trailer too. Can you talk about the decision on that and how you got that? Was that was that all one shot? Yeah, it was. It was. It was a, it was a candid Dutch angle, uh, a, a kind of uh, a bracket for the camera where we could do that and be on a track as well. Um, uh, so we were panning and tracking the other way and tilting the camera 180 degrees. Um, we loved it. Harris and Beluka shot Thor as well, and uh, we had a lot of fun over the years. Uh, talking about how many people were driven mad by the canted angles in, in, I in, 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 Thor. in Thor. I loved him in Thor, but obviously some people didn't. Um, and and uh, people say, he can't, he can never stop doing it. And we thought, <laughs> we've got to be able to get one into this movie. And that was it. We thought, well, we're moving. They'll never know. They'll right. never know. <laughs> you know. And also, it's crazy. It's midnight. She has to get back home. So I'm glad you enjoyed it. As a director, though, that choice of that shot, what do you, what do you want the audience to think about as they see the movie? Because literally, she, the world is turning upside down. Right. Her world is turning upside down. And it, it's literally literally going to be coming apart in a minute in the form of uh, footmen who will become lizards, yeah. horses that become mice, so it's literally, whoa, how do I keep, how do I keep, how do I keep level, yeah. not easily. Uh, and also, it's that, that room is full of portraits, so it was partly saying, mm. look at all these people, that's a prince's family, that's a king's family, that's, whoa, it just sort of, oh. so it felt like there were people crowding in on her as well, so it, it just, was cool. uh, it, was, it was nice. Now, the moment when we actually get the carriage and everything with Helena Bonham Carter and, and, and we were watching that scene, when you're shooting that like what does it look like on set for the actors are they seeing I mean I know it's a lot of a CGI as yeah. it turns in but what are they seeing what do you well we you give them as much as we can and Helena particularly always loves to see as much as she can so mm. if there's a greenhouse there for instance with, with a pumpkin we had an enormous inflatable pumpkin that's what, the, so, that's what she just told me she was, yeah. running, she was yeah. running with her arms out yeah 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 there was there was uh, and there was a funny moment where uh, uh, Lily and when Lily and, and uh, Helena get squashed in, in between between the expanding pumpkin yes. and a greenhouse it's a real expanding pumpkin in a real greenhouse so uh, we try to we try to because they're so lunatic and ludicrous r r to, to bring these sizable objects to bear. And often they were markers for our CGI shots, but they were great inspirations for the actors' imaginations. Oh man, those shots were awesome. They really, really were. Now, when you're directing a scene where Kate Blanchett's being completely cruel to her, and like, and as we watch these moments, and the camera cuts, you you yell cut. Does Kate stay mean like, 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 to keep the character going, or does she kind of go, ah, oh, I'm just kidding, we're, we're all good? <laughs> well, it's an interesting question. I think some people carry a little kind of, uh, carry a little afterburn. I didn't notice particularly that Kate did it, but sometimes I would encourage people when the scene was finished to improvise that there might be a moment or a physical action or whatever, and... Uh, I was always pretty careful to think, no, I think it's done now, I can shout cut, and then she won't shout at me. Yeah. Uh, so it was, uh, I think p people were able to play just up to the final whistle and then drop. One more nerdy question for you without me up. The people who were trying the shoe on that couldn't actually get the yeah. shoe on, was that an actual strain of them trying to put it on? Like, did you, because I know the shoe itself has a, it's like cut off at the at the foot, yeah. so no one can actually wear it. Yeah. But how are like how are, are they actually putting it into the shoe? How does I'm that work? They are. Yeah, I'm afraid <laughs> they are. We kept saying, you know, in in one version of the story in the Brothers Grimm, uh, they cut their toes off in order to try and the stepsisters I, cut their yes. toes. Yes. Yeah. So we don't do that. But if we could, yeah, if we could get real close to that, that would be we, great. Obviously, no toes hurt in the making of this picture. Yeah, we need to combine Cinderella and Game of Thrones and get Rob Stark to come back to life. Yeah. Rich, a, rich, rich, do the toe thing. Someone yeah, get George R. R. Martin on the phone. Let's yeah, get this yeah, taken yeah, care yeah, of yeah, immediately. George, like it's just an insert. It's a tribute thing. Yeah, <laughs> good to see you, buddy. Good Thank you so you. much. Red Thanks wedding so. in Cinderella. Could Thank you imagine? You. Oh, my God.